see and get ready for uh, day three of testimony. I'm Michael Meese, I'm a special agent with the Bureau of Criminal Investigation for the state of North Dakota. What do you do for BCI? Uh, right now I'm assigned as a criminal investigator. I'm also a narcotics uh, agent with the Metro Area Narcotics Task Force. How long have you been employed with BCI? Uh, approximately four years. Did you work any law enforcement jobs prior to working with BCI? Yeah, prior to that, I worked for the McKenzie County Sheriff's Office as a patrol deputy uh, criminal investigator, and I was assigned to the Northwest Narcotics Task Force up there as well. So as a BCI special agent assigned to criminal investigations, what is it that you do? Uh, essentially, we provide support to local agencies depending on what their needs are in criminal investigations throughout the state of North Dakota. What sort of training or education do you have to do that? Um, I've passed the North Dakota Law Enforcement Training Academy. I'm also a graduate of the uh, National Forensics Academy from the University of Tennessee uh, that specialized in criminal investigations, with, including crime scene management, with certifications in bloodstain pattern analysis, shooting incident reconstruction, and fire and arson investigations as well. How did you become involved in this case? Uh, approximately January 6th, the Burley County Sheriff's Department reached out to the Bureau of Criminal Investigation requested assistance in searching for evidence related to a possible murder arson. And that was in 2020? Correct. And you were doing criminal investigations for BCI back then as well? I was, yes. So what was the first thing that you did once you got assigned to this case? Uh, once I was assigned, I ended up uh, acquiring a team of agents and law enforcement officers uh, we attended a briefing from the Burley County Sheriff's Department that they had acquired another search warrant for the residents uh, in question. They proceeded over to execute the warrant and we began a uh, search of the residents. And where was that residence located? I believe it was 4900 43rd Avenue Northeast. In Burley County? Correct. And what was your role during the search? Uh, primary. <clears throat> Excuse me, the primary role that I had was to manage the team. Uh, I also took up the uh, role of conducting and assisting in the search and acquiring evidence. Were pictures taken by BCI during this search? They were. I've handed you States Exhibit 78 through 91, 94 through 96, and 99 through 100. Can you take a look at those and tell me if those are the photos that were taken during the search that you assisted with in Burley County on January 6, 2020? Are they a fair and accurate depiction of what you observed on that date? Yes. I would offer those exhibits, Your Honor. They would be 78 through 91, 94 through 96, 99, and 100. Objection, Your Honor. Exhibits 78 through 91, 94 through 96, and 99 and 100 are received. And those photographs detail um, searches throughout the, the whole residence, correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll take them um, a little bit at a time, but what was the condition of the house when you entered to perform that search? Uh, notably, I um, observed the door to be locked. They had to breach the door to enter the house. Uh, within the house, there was a lot of what would be smoke damage soot throughout the residence. 
appeared to be already boot marks uh, and other trails leading throughout the house that indicated there was uh, prior entry by other individuals, which would be consistent with the previous entry from law enforcement of other responders. That continued throughout the house. Um, there was major fire damage coming from uh, the master bedroom, uh, along with fire damage to a furnace unit in the basement as well. Had you conducted other arson investigations in your career? I have. And do you have any special training in conducting arson investigations? Uh, basic investigation training for arson. Okay. So uh, what did you observe when you were in the basement doing the sweep down there? Uh, essentially, I noticed there was smoke damage uh, throughout the basement. There's also what appeared to be fire damage um, to the furnace unit itself. I did note that the furnace unit had the open panel to it. Uh, I observed there to be actual wires that were still connected within the furnace unit on the bottom side of the furnace unit. It appeared to be debris below um, the furnace unit itself on the ground and debris uh, above in a um, small area above all the wiring on the top of the furnace unit. Who was all assisting or involved in the search on January 6th? Um, there was a numerous amount of law enforcement agents uh, and officers. There was also uh, Special Agent Derek Hill at the ATF uh, and also Deputy Fire Marshal Levi Rolene was also assisting. To your knowledge, was the Assistant Fire Marshal also taking photographs for his portion of the investigation? Yes, he was. Was there anything else that you noticed when you were in the basement? Uh, in the basement, I had observed what appeared to be a torn piece of a Marlboro cigarette pack on the ground near the furnace as well. And um, what was, was there anything about it that caused you to notice it or that it appeared to be something that you would know? Uh, other than the relevance of it being uh, close to the furnace unit itself, um, raised a question in our mind of curiosity more than anything. Uh, however, it didn't play a vital role at that time into providing some sort of evidence to the furnace itself. It's exhibit number eight, which is a floor plan of the basement, which shows the location of the furnace. Um, which side of the furnace or where was this piece of cigarette pack found? Uh, the piece of cigarette pack would have been to what would be the northwest side of the furnace. If you were looking directly at the furnace where the panel was taken off, it would have been on the ground on the northwest side. Okay, so kind of in front of the furnace where that panel was taken off? Correct. And did you collect that as a piece of evidence, or what did you do with it? We did not. We ended up documenting it uh, as just a relative item that was close to the uh, furnace itself and took photos and noted it in the report. And are one of the exhibits that um, was entered that you have in front of you the photo that you took of that piece of cigarette pack? Yes. And which exhibit is that? The exhibit 78. Okay. So I'm showing States Exhibit 78. That's what you observed in front of the furnace? Correct. Um, so at the time that you saw that, were you aware of anyone in the house that was a smoker? We weren't aware. and It hadn't become a question at that time yet. All right. But you documented it anyway? Correct. For what reason? Uh, just generally we uh, document a lot of our observations that we make whether it's evidentiary or not um, that happened to just be one of them there just because it sparked curiosity it seemed out of place but we didn't have an evidentiary value to that item yet so just to preserve it in case it became important later correct um, while you were in the basement did you um, do any investigation or review of the furnace yourself or along with Assistant State, or sorry, Deputy Fire Marshal Rolene? Yeah, De Deputy Fire Marshal Rolene did a majority of the um, evaluation of the furnace unit, uh, along with evaluating the um, furnace unit filter to that unit as well. 
And did you assist with that or were you present when that was done? I was. And did you also take photographs of that? I believe so. I direct you to exhibits 99 and 100. So I'm showing State's Exhibit 99. First, I want to know, um, from this photograph, where would you have found that cigarette pack piece? That cigarette pack would have been, lo that piece of the cigarette pack would have been located below out of frame to the bottom of the picture itself. So almost where the photographer's standing? Correct. Okay. And um, you had said that the, um, the cover had been removed. Do you know who removed that cover? I don't. It was off when you first saw the furnace as well? Yes. And you had talked about the furnace filter that was reviewed? Correct. And why was that? Uh, generally, during fire investigations, especially if the furnace unit has some sort of ignition source or anything like that, if the furnace were to quit working, uh, no f air would have been filtered through that air filter, thus not allowing it to um, acquire any soot in the air filter. So uh, and generally, that's uh, one of multiple reasons. So deputy fire marshal takes that apart and evaluates the air filter. And in state's exhibit number 99, do you see where the air filter was located in that picture? I do. And where is that? Uh, it's to the side between the filter and, and HVAC. Okay. And a photo was taken of that filter too in state's exhibit 101, correct? Correct. And which side of the filter was this? I don't recall which side. Okay. Um, was there anything about the filter that um, stuck out to you as being maybe something that um, assisted in causing the fire? Um, not that I could recall, no. Didn't appear to be clogged or needing changing or anything like that? Not that I recall. Okay. And was that filter um, preserved or collected for evidence? I believe it was. States Exhibit number 101. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is it? <clears throat> this is the air filter from the basement. Is it in substantially the same condition as when you saw it on January 6th? Yes. I would offer 101, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 101 is received. And if you could hold it up and show the jury each side of it and then explain kind of what we're looking at there. It, this is generally just a basic air filter. Um, as you can see, it's heavily covered in soot throughout the filter itself. There doesn't seem to be any major obstructions through the air filter other than soot that gathered within the filter. Thank you. So after you finished up in the basement, where did you go? Uh, we proceeded back up to the main floor. Um, throughout the kitchen and in the living room. Investigators that have previously been there indicated that the main master bedroom and the basement were our primary areas of concern. Uh, so I proceeded back over into the master bedroom. Did you make any observations on your way up to that bedroom? Uh, throughout the, the house appeared to have, again, uh, covered in heavy soot, um, different, uh, different items throughout. I, I, that would indicate fire damage uh, to include um, heavy fire damage down near the end of the, the hallway where the master bedroom was. You could, you could tell that there was a primary cause for fire that occurred in the master bedroom that came out into the hallway at one point or stopped right near the hallway. Um, on the entry down the hallway, we identified there was a, uh, a gun sock sitting on a chair in the living room uh, that seemed out of place. And then we entered into the master bedroom, which appeared to have major fire damage, major smoke damage. And when you went into that bedroom, what was the first thing that you had done? Uh, initially, we get our overall photos done and we begin a systematic search of the bedroom itself. What were you looking for at that time? At that time, we're just looking for um, 
various points of evidence that may have been uh, undiscovered the first time around. So we uh, go across whatever the there's bedding that's placed in there, identifying what may have caused a fire, what may have been a fuel source for fire, um, different if there's any blood stains, if there's any. Um, uh, shot incident reconstruction that we can do. We try and acquire that evidence by doing a more thorough search within that room itself. And photographs were taken that you have up there documenting what you observed, correct? Correct. So looking at State's Exhibit number 79, which portion of the bedroom is this? Uh, this would have been a uh, corner of the bedroom across from the bathroom entrance. So this would be the opposite wall from the bathroom? Correct. And um, there's a, a little yellow tent with the number two on it. Can you tell us what that's all about? Correct. That yellow tent number two is identifying uh, a shotgun wad that was located on the floor. North Dakota BCI Special Agent Michael Meese on yeah, the stand uh, this morning, the first witness of the day. We'll get a commercial break in here and get you back into the courtroom right after this. Love triangle with a tragic ending. Nikki Ensel is accused of killing her husband. Her boyfriend pled guilty for his part. Now she's facing a jury and life in prison if convicted. The cheating wife murder trial today. Welcome back. An alleged love triangle ending in a burning house and a husband shot to death. Nikki Sue Ensel first denied being aware of her husband's death, but when challenged about her suspicious movements around the time of the murder, she admitted to a deadly fight between her husband and her boyfriend, Earl. Now Nikki faces a jury as they decide whether or not she conspired with Earl Howard to have her husband killed, commit arson, and tamper with evidence. The first witness of the day is on the stand. Let's get you back. It's Michael Meese. He's a BCI special agent in North Dakota detailing his investigation of the home after being called out to help. Side over there. Um, it, that was kind of an issue, and we began investigating the wall itself for any determination of evidence. Uh, while we were investigating in that, inside that B pattern of the wall, I was able to locate what appeared to be a shot, uh, would be a gunshot of a, uh, like a bird shot or a, or a target shot from a shotgun shell in, embedded into the wall. And where did you find that in this picture, States Exhibit 86? That would have been um, primarily to the left of the um, would have been the window trim above the top of the bed in the dark black portion of the fire. And State's Exhibit number 88, what is this? Uh, that was the, the area of where we had located the shot. What are the tape, or what's the tape that you had put around it? The measuring tape helps us in identifying the distance between BBs or the shot spread. Um, from the shot. This also uh, helps us identify um, where exactly it is on the wall and where it may have taken place uh, and then a possible distance of the shot itself. So looking at State's Exhibit number 78, can you explain what we're looking at here? Yep, so this is uh, sort of a repetitive photo from the entryway looking into the room mostly defining where the shot is. We highlighted the shot itself um, to help identify it in the photographs uh, for examination as well. How did you highlight it? Uh, we used like a chalk substance or a whiteout substance uh, within the shot. And since it's embedded um, and then there was a fire char that went over it, we were able to use that to circle, almost circle where every BB was that we were able to locate. And the mattress that's um, on or in this photo at this point, had the bedding been removed from it? We had removed the bedding at that point, yes. So this is just the mattress? Correct. <clears throat> State's exhibit number 90, what are we looking at here? This is a close-up of uh, the shot. And State's exhibit number 91. Um, again, this is going to be a close-up of numerous voids, bloodstain patterns. Um, I also like to note there is what appears to be fall-off from the bed 
as well that was burning and smoldering that outlined the bed when it was on fire that leads over to um, the, the fire pattern on the floor as well. Was there anything significant about the round void in this photograph that assisted in the investigation? Uh, I believe it helped investigators that were primarily on scene first to help identify um, certain items in their certain locations when they arrived on scene. Okay. Now, the blood trail that you had taken photographs of kind of around the bed leading to where Chad was found, was there anything done to test that or to um, determine whether or not it, it indeed was blood? Yeah, we were able to take um, in the field is presumptive blood tests of those samples, of a sample of it, and they were identified as human blood at that time. So with that presumptive test, was there anything you did to preserve some of that for later testing? Uh, essentially, we take the primary source of the sample, um, we extract that from the source itself, and then that gets sent to the lab. That was all sent over to uh, Burley County, ended up taking custody of that and, and porting it onto the lab. Did you also take a sample or a portion of the carpet? Uh, I, I believe investigators did, yes. you states exhibit number 93 are you familiar with that object yes and what is that would have been a sample of the carpet from the master bedroom and is that in substantially the same condition as when you saw it in the bedroom yes i would offer 93 your honor did you take that sample i don't believe i did so i'd object to its admissibility i'd object i would object to the admissibility of the exhibit your honor Foundation or what? Foundation. He didn't. He didn't collect the sample. Although he didn't collect the sample, Your Honor, he was able to provide proper foundation as to where it came from, and that it's in the substantially the same condition. Yeah, the, the objection is overruled. Was anything else done um, regarding analysis of the blood trail? Uh, to my knowledge, um, Burley County was handling any sort of analysis of blood trails or then the fire marshals was handling any sort of fire analysis as well. All right. Um, what else did you observe in the bedroom? I also observed a uh, void on the bed as well. Um, the void appeared to be in the shape of a shotgun. I'm showing States Exhibit number 94. Is that what you're referring to? That's correct. And where was this photo taken? This was taken uh, inside the master bedroom and it's uh, taken of the bed itself would have been at the foot of the bed. And I noticed there's a bottle on the bed um, next to that void that you identified as being of the shotgun. What was that? Correct. That was also what appeared to be a proper 12 whiskey bottle that was located next to that void as well. Um, States Exhibit number 95, that's just a close-up of that, is that correct? Correct. And States Exhibit number 96. <clears throat> uh, this would have been a um, side table that was located within the master bedroom as well, near the closet of the bedroom, also contained uh, what appeared to be a Crown Apple Crown, Ro Crown Royal whiskey bottle that was tipped over and had liquid on the end of it. Uh, There's also... Um, a Kleenex box as well sitting on there. And to your knowledge, were those bottles um, seized by law enforcement as well? I don't recall if they were. Right. Was there anything else that you had made note of in the bedroom or that you had investigated in that back bedroom? Or was that the extent of it? Primarily when managing the teams, that was a uh, majority of my extent of assisting with their uh, search in that room. 
What was the next thing you did in this investigation? Uh, after that, we had um, acquired a search warrant for the Staybridge Suites uh, for Miss Ensel's room at room 333 that was executed on January 7, 2020. And were you involved in the execution of that warrant as well? I was. And what was your role in that? Uh, essentially, I was to assist in gathering evidence. Do you know if photos were taken of that search as well? There was. While they look through the evidence there, we'll slip at a commercial break, get you back into the courtroom right after this. 510. Hello, 911. We got packed to shooter. Look out, look out, look out. A shot in the face. People everywhere, bodies everywhere, chaos everywhere. This is just a kid. How did he get here? Were there moments where you second guessed yourself? No. There's no one way to say this person is or this person isn't going to become a mass shooter. Court TV presents Rampage Killers. Premieres October 2nd, only on Court TV. Welcome back. You're watching Court TV Live. Back on January 2nd, 2002, Nikki Sue Ensel called 911 about a house fire. When the fire department arrived, they discovered a deceased man inside a bedroom with a propane heater near the foot of the bed. Suspicions were raised immediately. An autopsy showed that Nikki Sue's husband, Chad, had died, not from the fire, but from two gunshot wounds. A love triangle and motive then started to reveal itself. Ensel's paramour, Earl Howard, was convicted in the murder of Chad. Now, it's a jury's Turn to Judge Nikki and her involvement. She's accused of conspiring with her boyfriend to kill her husband. Let's get you back into the courtroom where Michael Meese, a North Dakota BCI special agent who was brought in to help with the investigation into this case, is on the stand. Seized while he came across the border. And where did that search take place? That took place in Port Huron. Do you recall what kind of vehicle it was? I believe it was a white Chevrolet pickup. And again, were photos taken during that search? They were. I just handed you state's exhibits 115 to 118. Do you recognize those? I do. And what are those? Uh, they are essentially overall photos of the vehicle and then items that were located within the vehicle. And are they, um, do they fairly and accurately depict what you observed when the search was conducted? They do. Your Honor, I would offer 115 to 118. No objection. The exhibits are received 115 through 118. Looking at 115, what are we looking at? Uh, this was the vehicle that Mr. Earl was located in coming across the border. And State's Exhibit 116. This would have been a picture of the front passenger floorboard and seat. Uh, this picture contains uh, Bianco Realty magazine along with a bag uh, with Mr. Howard's property. In. And I don't want to assume anything, but the Bianco Realty, was that from Bianco Realty and Bismarck, Mandan area? Correct. Throughout the investigation, was it determined where Mr. Howard resides? Uh, yes. And do you recall where that is? Uh, he initially identified residing in Canada. States exhibit number 117, what are we looking at here? 
Uh, again, we're looking at um, items within the cab of the pickup. Specifically, there's a package with a label. Um, within that label, it identifies Nikki Ensel with an address of 3209 East Side Place in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, through the investigation, was it determined whether or not Ms. Ensel resided at that address at one point? I don't recall if investigators were able to determine that. And there's also, it looks like a folder of information from Wells Fargo underneath that. Did you take a look at that information? Correct. That appeared to be bank information as well. Was that, um, was that bank information seized? Um, I don't recall if it was. I'd have to reference my report. If it ref do you have a copy of your report? If not up here, no. Would it refresh your recollection if you did look at a copy of your report? Yes, please. All right, as he looks at his report, they're going to bring it to him. He'll look it over. Natasha Robinson and Jeffrey Wolf is with us uh, out of Denver, uh, Natasha in Chicago. Natasha, um, this is a lot of repeat of what we had from the other agent, more enforcement of the crime itself, not a lot pointing you know, towards the defendant, but needed. Yes, absolutely. They're just uh, going through the painstaking details of establishing uh, not just the physical evidence against the defendant, but also uh, the chain of custody, trying to make sure that the jury understands that the reasons why these measures were taken uh, is because this is what uh, law enforcement does. They collect the evidence, they preserve it, and they do it with the intention of trying to demonstrate that something was awry, uh, thus in case the uh, arson which was the uh, cover-up, at least as which the prosecution is alleging, based upon the cause of death being the gunshot wounds to Mr. Ensel's head. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, looks like uh, they're now getting some more. Let's do this. Going to break in here and then uh, get you back into the courtroom with more right after this. Story. The feud between families they came in like thieves in the night and took eight lives. George Wagner faces murder charges in connection with the killing. It's a chilling story. The Ohio Family Massacre Trial. Live coverage today on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. A love triangle turned deadly after the victim's home is set on fire. Chad Ensel's wife, Nikki, is now on trial for the conspiracy of his murder. Back in February, Nikki's paramour, Earl Howard, was sentenced to 25 years for the murder of Chad. Now a jury must determine whether Nikki also conspired to help Howard in shooting her husband and setting the home on fire. Let's go back into court. On the stand all morning long has been Michael Meese. He is a North Dakota BCI special agent reviewing information and evidence retrieved from the scene. you exhibits 119, 121, 122, 123, and 124. Do you recognize those exhibits? I do. And are those items that were seized during the search or um, of the pickup? They were. From, and were they handled, or I'm sorry, are they in substantially the same condition as when they were obtained? Yes. I would offer, Your Honor, State's Exhibit 119, 121, 122, 123, and 124. Objection, Your Honor. Exhibits 119 and 121 through 124 are received. Starting with Exhibit 119, could you show that to the jury and explain what that is? Exhibit 119 contains a black and colored hat and sunglasses consistent with uh, male headwear. What about 121? 121 contains a Mar Marlboro red cigarette box, um, a transaction record uh, for the red carpet car wash uh, with the date of January 1st, 2020 in Bismarck, North Dakota. 
Also a New Vision business card for us, Stefan Von Hayden for uh, New Vision in Bismarck, North Dakota. Was there anything um, when you were doing that search and finding those items um, that was significant to you in the investigation? Um, specifically, the Marlboro cigarette box uh, helped identify uh, a possible ignition source for the furnace and uh, identified that uh, it was consistent with being um, belonging to Mr. Howard and being in the same basement residence of the, of the scene itself. The transaction record, uh, again, helped identify um, that a transaction occurred uh, at the red carpet car wash with that date of January 1st, 2020. And that was, this was also found in the vehicle of Mr. Howard. That transaction was at Bismarck, North Dakota, again, at the red carpet car wash. Was there a time on that transaction receipt? That transaction occurred at 2021-34, which had been about 8, 21-34 seconds p.m. And then if you want to move on to 122, Exhibit 122, what was that? Exhibit 122 is a black journal that was also located within the vehicle as well. Did you review that journal? I was able to review the journal later on, yes. And was there anything significant in the investigation found in the journal? Uh, regarding the investigation, there was information uh, regarding um, AT&T phone information for uh, a person indicated for Nikki. And um, it's in a Ziploc bag, so you can remove it if you'd like to look at it and show us where that's at. going to be account information for a Wells Fargo account um, or a, a indicators for a Wells Fargo account, uh, AT&T information that indicates a new cell phone plan with Nikki as admin. Uh, this is earmarked as done. Uh, there's a Best Buy with a drop that says cameras for Dash. Uh, riddles that says tonight itemized list of items bought for insurance and then necklace repair. There's also insurance info, fire safe, um, Christopher birth certificate from Brown County Courthouse in Aberdeen. Was there anything else that you noted in there that was significant? There's also another page that indicates uh, what says AT&T and then provides a phone number. There's also a 30 days that's above that as well. Uh, in a box, it says Nikki Sue Ensel, authorized user for phone number. There's also a passcode in parentheses within that box. Uh, there's a web address for ATT.com. Um, there's also a, a note for 30 days, upper right corner. Uh, and then there's also another box that indicates profile list authorized user. Was there anything else in the journal that you noted that stuck out to you in this investigation? <clears throat> there is also a, a note in here that indicates Nintendo Switch light only. Uh, pre with what appears to be a price for two seventy nine ninety nine, new for two ninety nine ninety nine, uh, with Kirkwood Mall after it as well. And why was that significant to you? That indicates uh, anyone that's familiar with Bismarck would be familiar with the Kirkwood Mall in the area. Was there anything else within the journal that stood out to you?
There is um, a lot of diagrams as well, too, within the journal. These diagrams are drawn with squares and suspected measurements uh, with different identities for switches um, and location of different items as well, too, within the diagram. There's cards, breakers, um, fuse individual valves is what's written on here as well, too. Uh, looks to be some sort of electrical information for ground, terminals, fuses, and so on. It's throughout the journal as well. And then moving on to Exhibit 123. Can you explain what that is? Exhibit 123 is a red carpet car wash receipt. Uh, this red carpet car wash is located in Jamestown, North Dakota. The receipt is for 12-28 um, of 2019. It was uh, printed at 11-12 p.m. And why was that significant to you? Uh, that identified that this receipt would have had to have been acquired um, before the incident itself. And then States Exhibit Number 124. What is that? 124 is uh, a FedEx shipment summary. This shipper is an Earl Howard uh, with an address in Bellwood, Ontario. The recipient is a Chad Ensel of, with an address of 3209 Eastside Place in Bismarck, North Dakota. Is there anything within that documentation that says what's being shipped? <clears throat> it appears there's, um, it identifies one package. The description of goods indicates other. Uh, the country manufacturer is CA for Canada. Uh, the total value is identified as uh, 5.0. The weight is two pounds. So nothing specific as to what's being shipped, correct? Correct. Did you have any other involvement in this case? Uh, no. Thank you. I have no other questions, Your Honor. Mr. Glass. Just a couple of years. All right, uh, there is the first witness of the day, the direct testimony just finishing up. Uh, BCI special agent brought in to help with the investigation to try to solve the murder of Chad Ensel. We want to uh, thank Natasha for her um, expertise this morning. And Jeffrey's going to stick around next hour. We're going to get a break in here as we approach the top of the hour. When we come back, we'll have the cross examination of the BCI agent. That is next. Stay with us. You're about to fix it. Welcome back to Court TV. I'm Ted Rollins. Testimony underway this morning in the cheating wife murder trial in North Dakota. Nikki Ensel is accused of conspiring with her boyfriend, Earl Howard, to kill her estranged husband, Chad, for insurance money and a new life. Chad Ensel was found shot to death after Nikki called 911 to report that her house was on fire. Prosecutors allege that Nikki and Earl started that fire in an attempt to cover up evidence. Right now, another witness has taken the stand. His name is Joe Ahrens. He's a special agent with the North Dakota BCI, second witness of the day. He has just taken the stand. Let's go into courtroom live. County. So what was your assignment or what was the first thing you did when you got that assignment? Um, once we met with the Burley County Sheriff's Department and they explained the nature of what they were investigating. Uh, we went out to the residence and made entry into the residence. There was nobody there. Uh, we did a walkthrough of the residence just to see what the scene looked like and kind of have an idea of what we were dealing with. Um, my primary assignment was just to help search for any evidence throughout the residence. And to do that, what did you do? Um, searched various rooms throughout the residence um, to see if there was any evidence that um, would pertain to this investigation. 
And was there any particular location within the home that you processed or that you focused on? Um, I actually searched several of the rooms. Uh, I believe the last room I actually went to would have been um, what I guess you would call the master bedroom. There were other agents that were processing that, and I just came in later to assist. Was there anything of evidentiary value that you were able to obtain um, in searching those other areas of the home? No, there wasn't. So what did you do in that master bedroom to assist? Um, one of the things I did is I assisted in um, using a chemical that um, we use in crime scenes to help us um, find blood that maybe isn't visible or very visible to the naked eye. Um, it's a chemical that we can spray in the room or wherever it is that we're searching for any latent blood. And we have to have the room dark, I mean, really dark. And then when we spray this chemical, if there's blood there, um, it should glow a bright blue. Do you have any special training on how to use this substance or is there anything that you had to go through to be certified? Um, there's no certification or and no formal training that you go through. Um, I have been through a training on using it at the National Forensic Academy and then also when I was a detective with the Bismarck Police Department, um, it was a tool that was used on occasion and I was shown how to use it and how to properly use it by other detectives that had used it and had more experience with it at that time. Is there anything else that reacts with this chemical other than blood? Uh, yeah, there's various different things. Um, one of them that I've read about is turnips apparently will react to this, um, but there's other things. There's, there's numerous false positive type things that can. So it's what I would call a preliminary test. It's not, in the, it's not saying it's blood. It's indicating it might be blood. So it basically points you to locations that may need further investigation. Correct. And so did you use that chemical in the master bedroom? Yes, I did. And why was it determined that it needed to be done in the bedroom? Uh, especially Meats had actually requested that it did it. Um, there were some visible drip trails or what appeared to be drip trails, which are drops of blood that basically are, you can almost follow a trail in there that were visible. And he wanted to spray around in that area and see if there was any other areas around there that maybe we just weren't seeing. So how do you spray it? Is it? Does it come with a machine or is it just like a spray bottle? Okay, so the substance I'm talking about is called Blue Star. And basically what it is, is it's two tablets that you put in a bottle with distilled water. You, dis you dissolve the tablets. Once the tablets are dissolved, you use a spray bottle and you spray it um, in mist the area. And then when this substance comes in contact with blood, it should glow up bright blue. How long does that reaction take to happen? Uh, it's rather quickly, almost instantaneously. Were there any particular areas within the master bedroom that you had sprayed? I sprayed, I sprayed around the outside of where the bed would be, so along both sides of the bed and the foot of the bed, or the floor um, at the foot of the bed, and then I sprayed an area of the wall where we could see a handprint, but we wanted to see if there was anything else that we weren't seeing. And since you said it has to be really dark when you do this, are you able to photograph the reaction? Yes, you are. And did you do that in this case? I did not personally, but yes, we did. Um, I believe Special Agent Kimberly actually was our photographer for that, and he took those photographs. And you were there when those were taken? Yes, I was. States exhibits number 126 and 127. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And what are those documents? Um, those are two photographs. One, uh, they're essentially the same photograph, just with different exposure. So one is dark and just shows the glow of the blue, and the other photograph, um, when the shutter speed and exposure are changed, allows for there to be, to, for us to actually see what's being photographed and not just a black photo with blue in it. 
And do those photographs, um, do they fairly and accurately depict what you observed when you did this testing? Yes. I would offer 126 and 127, Your Honor. Okay. Since 126 and 127 are received. So I'm showing 126 on the screen behind us. What are we looking at here? That is the bedroom and along that wall where you can see the electric heater that would have been one of the sides of the bed or the floor next to the bed and then it the blue trail goes around to basically the foot of the bed and then over to where uh, Miss Grenzel was found deceased. In state's exhibit number 127, what are we looking at there? Essentially it's the same photograph but with a different exposure, so you just can't see exactly what is being photographed, but you can see the blue glow from uh, the blue star reacting with that substance on the floor. After you finished with that, was there anything else that you assisted with? Uh, yes, I assisted just a small amount with cutting out a piece of sheetrock from the wall near where the head of the bed would have been. What was the reason for cutting out that piece of sheetrock? Um, it appeared that there were pellets from a shotgun shell that were embedded into the wall. How were you able to remove that piece of sheetrock from the wall? Um, I, we used a reciprocating saw, I think, to cut that out. And that's what you did? Um, I stood by and watched him okay. do it, and I might have actually grabbed it at some point and helped, but... And what was done with that piece of sheetrock when it was cut away from the wall? Um, it was collected as evidence and packaged as evidence. And who maintained custody of that evidence? Um, it initially went to Special Agent Brianna Langing, who is our evidence custodian. Um, she's the one who packaged all the evidence, and then it would have all been turned over to the Burley County Sheriff's Department. you what's been marked as state's exhibit number 125 do you recognize that yes i do and what is that that is the piece of sheetrock that was removed from the wall with the shotgun pellets embedded in it is it in substantially the same condition as when it was removed from the wall yes i would offer 125 your honor objection exhibit 125 is received can you display that for the jury please There are some larger holes that are in that piece of sheetrock. Do you know where they came from or what caused them? Yes, I do. Um, those that? would have been where the sheetrock was secured to the stud, the wooden stud in the wall. So the nails just popped out and took some sheetrock with it? Is that pretty much I, what happened? I believe that's what happened. So those weren't significant in the investigation in any way? No. All right, thank you. I have nothing further for this witness, Your Honor. I have no questions for Officer Eric. I would, yes, Your Honor. Thank you for your testimony. If you want to admonish you, I'll talk to the